Welcome to Mutual Information. My name is DJ. In this video, we're going to learn about factor analysis and its close relative probabilistic PCA. As we'll see, these are clever old school ideas that are still effective today. And learning these will expose us to broadly useful concepts, in particular, generative modeling and dimensionality reduction. To start, I'll describe the data we're given and the problem we face. We are given an X matrix with N rows and D columns. We will assume each row is an independent sample from some unknown distribution P of X. The goal is to estimate that distribution. Let's consider an example. Let's say X is a 100 by two matrix, which can be pictured like this. Now, we need to come up with the distribution that matches these samples. Looking at this, the multivariate normal looks like a reasonable choice. If you don't recall, this distribution is parameterized by a length two mean vector mu and a covariance matrix sigma, which is a two by two matrix. These imply a certain probability density over this space. Using maximum likelihood, we'll pick our parameters such that this data is most likely. But this approach has a terrible life-threatening problem for large D. That is, the number of parameters in a multivariate normal is given with this function, which grows kind of like D squared. For example, if D equals 50, our multivariate normal would have 1,325 parameters. Estimating a model like that would require a ton of data. So the challenge is, we'd like to learn a distribution over this potentially high dimensional space, like when D is equal to 50, but with much less data. To do that, we'll need a model with fewer parameters. And that's where factor analysis comes in. Now, factor analysis is a generative latent variable model. Generative means if you've learned the parameters of the model, you could generate synthetic data that looks like the data you actually observed. Latent variable means it'll involve associating an unobserved vector with each observed XI. So to explain this model, I'm going to show you that generative process visually which may seem a bit arbitrary at first, but later we'll see how this makes for a model with fewer parameters. We'll start by representing a 500 by 30 matrix X. Each vertical line here represents one of its numbers. As you can see, I'm only showing the top four rows. For now, let's assume these columns have mean zero. Now, since we're talking a generative model, we need to think about how we could generate data that looks like this using only a few parameters and random variables. Okay, now the idea is to start with a single vector, which we'll call W1. We'll repeat this vector for every row of X. Also, let's say each row gets their own scalar multiplier. We can label these scalars as Z11, Z21, down to Zn1. Now we can adjust the Z values to gain some model flexibility. The idea is to pick our Z values, which can vary across the rows, and this W vector, which can vary along the columns, such that these dots look like our data. But this may not be flexible enough. So we allow ourselves to add in another version of this. In general, we can keep adding these in, and that'll increase the number of parameters. The number of these that we add up is a hyperparameter of our model that we'll call L. In this example, L equals two. Now, if we were to use this model as it is here, it would only be able to generate points that fall precisely on some 2D plane determined by these Ws. That's a pretty unrealistic assumption, so we need to extend this to reach any points in the 30 dimensional space. To do that, we add in a matrix of independent noise. Here, each column indicates samples from a mean zero normal with a variance of psi d, where d indicates a particular column. The thinking here is, quite often, x has columns with different levels of noise, so you want flexibility to model that. So now, are we done? Not quite. Let's say we want to generate a new synthetic row of data after we fit this model. From here, could we? Well, no, because for each sample data point, we need new Zs. So where would those come from? Well, surprisingly, we can safely say these Zs are normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. 
The reason we can get away with that seemingly specific choice is you actually don't get any additional modeling flexibility by allowing for different means and standard deviations of z. It turns out those could all be captured by adjusting the other parameters. With that, we're done showing the model mechanics. From here, fitting involves choosing our parameters, including the off-screen noise variances, such that they agree with our data. That means W1 will be scaled into a component of X, and W2 will be another component. Whatever is left over is explained by the noise. As we'll see later, this process is done by optimizing a likelihood function. With that, we could generate synthetic data by sampling fresh Zs, multiplying them with our Ws, and adding noise according to the size. Okay, so this is what people call the generative story. Now, let's state the factor analysis model properly. We start with the assumptions. First, we state that the latent variable zi has a multivariate normal distribution with a mean of zero and a unit diagonal covariance matrix. Here, zi is an unobserved length L vector where each is paired with one of our observed xi's. Note, this notation compresses those scalar multipliers we saw earlier into a vector. Second, we'll assume the distribution of an xi conditional on knowing the associated zi and all the model parameters is this. But what does this mean? Well, it says the density of xi is a multivariate normal with a certain mean and covariance matrix. The mean comes from matrix multiplying zi by the matrix w and then adding the vector mu. Also, for your information, W is called the factor loading matrix, and the ZIs are called the factors. Also, the ZIs are called the latent variables. Sorry for the confusion. Also, mu is a new parameter that didn't appear in the animation earlier. In that example, to keep things simple, I assume the columns of X had mean zero. Well, that's not true in general. So, mu is here to model those column means. What it does is, it allows everything else to proceed as though the columns of X did in fact have mean zero. Next, the covariance matrix is psi, where psi is a diagonal matrix where the diagonals are the psi Ds of each column. These are the column specific noise variances from earlier. Okay, so that's a lot to keep track of, so I'll write it all out in notation right here. Now, let's back up and notice that this also tells us the generative story. That is, if we pretend we know the parameters w, mu, and psi, we could generate synthetic samples. To do that, we generate a zi according to this, and then we transform it using this. With that and the psi covariance, we can draw samples from this multivariate normal, giving us a sample of xi. If we chose our parameters correctly, this sample should look like it came from our data. And now we can see a motivation for this model from a different angle. Let's pretend again that our parameters w, mu, and psi are known. And let's ask a question. What distribution over x does this imply? Remember, that's our goal after all. In other words, let's say we repeatedly sampled z's to generate many, many x's. What distribution would those x's have? Well, fortunately, the answer is pretty simple. The distribution of x would be given by yet another multivariate normal, which is this. Now, let's inspect this expression. First, we notice that the overall mean of any x after you average out all the z's that could produce it is just mu. That's nice. It's the same thing we'd use if we were just fitting a plain multivariate normal. But here's the interesting part. The covariance matrix of x after the z's have been averaged out. We'll call this c. We see it has two terms. One is the outer product of W, and the other is the diagonal psi matrix. So these two together are our approximation to X's covariance matrix. The interesting thing is, if L is much less than D, which it should be, then this expression involves a lot fewer parameters than the roughly D squared over two involved in a typical multivariate normal. This is the whole point. With this, we could fit a model in higher dimensions with much less data. However, an L substantially less than D is not without its cost. It may yield too inflexible of a model. Here, L, like in many models, is a hyperparameter that allows us to flexibly move from simple and easy to estimate models to complex and hard to estimate models. In fact, if L equals D, 
and this is equivalent to a plain multivariate normal. Also, quick sidebar. You can invert these equations to give you a distribution over z given an x. Remember, we never actually observe any z's. We just assume they exist to generate our observations. But we can estimate a distribution over what their likely values are. And it turns out to be yet another normal distribution. In this case, they have some weird looking mean and covariance, so I'll spare you and I'm not gonna include them. What's important is how this could be useful. Basically, zi tells you how much xi is explained by the factors, which could be an insightful inference. Also, it provides a mapping from xi to the mean estimate of zi. Since zi has lower dimension than xi, this is a type of dimensionality reduction which can be useful in a pre-processing step in a modeling pipeline. Okay, now we need to discuss how we actually fit this model. Given these assumptions and our observations of X, how do we learn our parameters? Well, as is quite often the case, we will fit this by maximizing the log likelihood of our data. That is, we want to maximize this. One thing to note is that the Z's are not here. That's because we only care about the distribution over X after you average out the Z's. The Z's are useful for generating synthetic data or dimensionality reduction, but we don't need them for maximum likelihood. So how do we optimize this? Well, it turns out we need iterative algorithms. From what I've read, there are two options. One is based on singular value decomposition and the other uses expectation maximization. I'm going to only briefly discuss the SVD-based approach because that's what they use in scikit-learn, and I suspect that's what most of you will use for factor analysis. That said, the literature makes a compelling case for the advantages of using EM. Okay, so how does the SVD-based approach work? Well, it turns out mu is super easy. The maximum likelihood estimate of mu turns out to be the average of the X columns. Easy. But from here, things get a bit trickier. The approach is to alternate between optimizing for W and optimizing for Psi. That is, given a W, we can solve for Psi and vice versa. So we initialize randomly and iterate until the log likelihood stops improving. If you're curious, here is a high level sketch of the algorithm. It's only to give you a sense of what's happening here, so no precise details. If you're interested in those, see Barber's book in my sources. That said, one thing worth calling out is, on each iteration, you are running a singular value decomposition algorithm. If X is really big, that could become expensive. Fortunately, scikit-learn has options for speeding this up. Okay, before moving on, I need to point out something regarding the log likelihood. The log likelihood is invariant to orthogonal transformations of W. What that means is, if you were to substitute in WR for W, where R is an orthogonal matrix, then the log likelihood value would not change. If you're curious, here's why that's true. The way I think about this is, changing the orientation of W doesn't make a difference because the Z's can have an offsetting orientation to explain the data in the exact same way. So this is a type of unidentifiability, not a good thing. For one, it means if you rerun the algorithm, you'll get different values for W and Z. That makes it tricky to compare them across multiple runs. Second, it makes interpreting things difficult since you have to ignore whatever arbitrary rotation your fitting routine imposed. But that's it for factor analysis. You now know how the model creates a distribution over X using relatively few parameters, how it can be used to generate synthetic data, and how it can be useful to infer things about X or reduce its dimensionality. But wait, the title does say factor analysis and probabilistic PCA. So where is that? Well, conveniently, given what we've just learned, it's actually a very simple adjustment. It's the same thing as the factor analysis model, except we restrict psi to have the same value along the diagonal. Everything else remains the same, except one important consequence. That is, we can fit the parameters much more efficiently. Essentially, we only need to run a single eigenvalue decomposition. In other words, it's about an order of magnitude faster to fit a probabilistic PCA model than it is a factor analysis model. To see the solution, let's start by assuming we know sigma squared 
and let S be the sample covariance matrix. In that case, the maximum likelihood estimate for W is given by this. Now, I'm not going to derive this. That would take us too far afield. What I will do is describe what it's saying. First, you run an eigenvalue decomposition on S and select the L largest eigenvalues and their eigenvectors. Then essentially, the MLE of W is just those eigenvectors scaled by their eigenvalues after you adjust for the assumed noise variance. Also, an arbitrary orthogonal matrix R is included here to emphasize there is a whole space of Ws which maximize the likelihood. Got it? Okay, now let's move beyond fitting and ask, why is this called probabilistic PCA? Well, a plot will help us here. Let's say we have these data points in 2D and we'll use an L equals one model with sigma set to this starting value. In this case, this line would represent the single column of W. Further, we could represent how the Z's reconstruct our X's using W with these points along the line. Now, the reason it's a type of PCA is, if we take the limit as sigma approaches zero, then W gives us the principal components of PCA. In other words, with a certain setting of this model, you get regular PCA. That's why it's called that. Also, this view reveals what the noise variance is doing for us. If the noise variance is high, the model shrinks our reconstructions of X towards the overall mean. And that means less of the movement of X is explained by the movement of the Z's. This intuition also operates in the factor analysis world. So if your model has really high noise variances, then your latent variables aren't helping much. But wait, isn't the noise variance also a parameter we need to learn? Yes, and probabilistic PCA also makes it easy to get that optimal value. It turns out the optimal noise variance is the average of the D minus L smallest eigenvalues not selected for W. This isn't terribly surprising. Our model wants to explain all of the variances in X, all of which is represented in the eigenvalues of S. Well, W will handle the largest L of these, so it's not unreasonable to say sigma is just the average of what remains. Whew. Okay, this only leaves one thing to say. Thank you for your focus.